Well, it looked like Kentucky basketball was done taking players to add to this roster for this upcoming season, but a new player has emerged that could fill the Wildcats' final scholarship spot. You are Locked On Kentucky, your daily podcast on the Kentucky Wildcats, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. All right, what's going on, Big Blue Nation? Welcome on into Locked On Kentucky, your daily Kentucky Wildcats podcast. I'm your host, Lance Dawn. On today's episode of Locked On Kentucky, we are going to be discussing a four-star prospect that could reclassify and could very well join the Kentucky Wildcats. We thought Mark Pope was done, but it looks like a new candidate to fill that final scholarship has emerged. Also on today's episode, SEC Media Days news. Could the conference be switching to nine games for their conference slate in football. Going to talk about what this means for the Cats. Going to talk about why I think Kentucky needs to capitalize on some things this football season, as well as what could this mean for the Governor's Cup. No more Governor's Cup between UK and Louisville. Going to discuss all of that on today's show. Thank you so much for making Locked On Kentucky your first listen every single day. I want to remind everyone out there that we are free and available on all platforms. And if you are watching on YouTube, YouTube. I would greatly appreciate it if you subscribe to the show. And if you are listening on podcast, I would also appreciate it if you subscribed there as well. Today's episode is brought to you by FanDuel. Make every moment more. And as playoffs wind down, the sports stop sporting like we want them to. But FanDuel is hooking up all customers with a boost or a bonus this summer every single day. That's right. There's something for everyone every day all summer long. So visit FanDuel.com to get started. All right, let's go ahead and get into it. Kentucky basketball in hot pursuit of a new potential final scholarship player. They went after a couple of different guys over these past several weeks. Jeremiah Fears, who decommitted from the University of Illinois. The most recent uh, pursuit, or at least interest, I should say, for the Kentucky Wildcats. I don't necessarily know if there was a ton of pursuit there, but it's looking like Kentucky has zeroed in on another prospect that I think really fits what Mark Pope wants to do, and whenever you listen to this kid talk about kind of where he wants to play, the atmosphere, the surroundings, the actual style it's looking like Kentucky would be a match made in heaven. Four-star prospect that is in the 2025 class that could reclassify to this year. His name is Julius Halifanawa, which is just an incredible name. He is a center in next year's class, a seven-foot, 290-pound player. He is rated as a four-star prospect on on three, the number 33 overall prospect and number three center in the 2025 class. He is not rated on 24-7 Sports, ESPN, or even Rivals. So Julius Halifanawa uh, only here on On3. The RPM, the recruiting prediction machine, currently has the Xavier Musketeers as the favorite to land Halifanawa. The uh, Sean Miller-led Xavier Musketeers, if I'm not mistaken. Virginia Tech also close in this race. Those are the two schools that he has visited. But the Kentucky Wildcats, alongside the Gonzaga Bulldogs, they've made some progress here as of late in his recruitment saying that, hey, we want you, and we want you to come play quickly, uh, get you to reclassify potentially uh, to this year's team. Jacob Polacek of KSR was the first to report on this, Julius Halifanawa and his movements. NBA Academy Center, he's been playing very well, actually, uh, during his time with the NBA Academy. During his recent games, averaging 16.2 points, 4.2 rebounds, and he's knocked down seven of eight threes through the week, he said, I've taken official visits to Virginia Tech and Xavier since the visit with VTech. They've been keeping in contact. They're here now watching him in Australia. I believe that's where he's currently playing. They've been able to stay in touch through Zoom calls, text messages, continue to develop the relationship there. Talking about Xavier, he said, I was just on a phone call with them this morning. They play through their bigs, and that is a big deal. And what I'm looking for in a school. You're probably going to hear that phrase come up a ton whenever we break down what Halifanal is about. They're not a huge school in terms of population of students, but their arena was crazy. The first time I've been to something like that, I love the atmosphere. I got to see a game. I really enjoyed myself. Uh, Hal Fanawa also has a variety of different bigger time schools recruiting him. Gonzaga, UNC, Kentucky, Georgetown. He said, I know uh, I was talking with North Carolina about a potential visit. Potentially Kentucky and Gonzaga are some schools I'm looking to visit. Maybe Georgetown too. When asked about Kentucky specifically, he said, 
I know they have a new coach. They reached out right before I came here, I believe, to the the uh, NBA Academy. So I'm going to talk with them after this and be talking with them to find out more about their program and their vision. So Halifanawa doesn't know a ton about the Kentucky Wildcats right now, but I'm sure once he gets to sort of understand what Mark Pope and company are about on both sides of the ball, I think he's really, really going to like the idea of potentially coming to UK this season. When you look at Kentucky's front court, I'll start here. You've got three different guys that I think you have to be pretty excited about, starting with Amari Williams, who came over from Drexel, three-time conference defensive player of the year in the CAA, really good rimmed protector, really good player around the rim, period. And then you look at Brandon Garrison, McDonald's All-American, former four-star, played, I think, excellent during his time at Oklahoma State in his freshman season, transfers over to the Cats. I think he's going to be special in years to come if he's able to stay here and he doesn't transfer out. I think he's going to be a really good player for UK. You've got those two guys right now locking down your center spot, so you would have to put Hal Fanawa uh, at that third spot in the rotation, and then it begs the question, does he actually end up getting playing time this season, or would Kentucky look elsewhere, or possibly even put the third guy I want to talk for a second about, Andrew Carr. Carr played a little bit of his minutes at Wake Forest at that center position. I think he's going to exclusively play power forward this season. That's just, that's an educated guess. That's not something I have confirmed. It's just an educated guess alongside guys like Ainsley Almanor. I think those are going to be people that you see at the four. Jackson Robinson could slide down in different rotations, but as far as the front court goes, Halifanawa, I think, would find a little bit of a difficult time finding minutes in this year's rotation. But if you're talking about development, if you're talking about going to a place that runs through their bigs, if you're talking about being an impact player in future seasons, at seven foot tall, 290 pounds, you could easily easily develop into an NBA draft selection, a high NBA draft selection, I might add, whenever you look at Hal Fanawa's game, underneath a player, or excuse me, underneath a coach like Mark Pope. He says a ton during his interviews that you see across uh, different websites about kind of what he's about and what he's looking for. He says, I want to go to a school that plays through their bigs. I want to go to a school who lets their bigs play with some freedom. I want to play for great coaches and be around some great teammates. Trust is big with me. All right, before we continue along here, I want to tell you guys about our friends over at FanDuel. I love sports, and I love them so much that I never want them to stop. But as the playoffs wind down, we get fewer and fewer games, and the sports aren't necessarily sporting like I want them to. But FanDuel lets me keep the sports going whenever I want, and all I have to do is open up the app and dream up bets anytime I'm in the mood. This summer, FanDuel is hooking up all customers with a boost or a bonus daily. That's right, there's something for everyone every day all summer long. So head head over to FanDuel.com and start making the most out of your summer. That is FanDuel, an official sports betting partner of Major League Baseball. And when talking about reclassification, he said, right now we're still trying to figure that out. It's going to be a big discussion, especially this week. We're going to discuss that and should have it decided by the end of the week. And Jacob Polachek, by the way, wrote this article today earlier about Julius Halifanawa, about how he could potentially be be reclassifying. We could get this answer in the next 72 hours about whether or not he could step in this year or he could be in addition in next year's class. Regardless of whether or not Halifanawa wants this season or next, I think he would be a phenomenal add to the roster for the Kentucky Wildcats. I think he would get to participate Uh, I think in scrimmages, obviously, during these practices and this season. And the next year, I think you would be able to actually take on a legitimate role and step in as what I would assume to be a redshirt freshman and really be able to establish himself as uh, one of the better centers in the SEC. I I think immediately, if he is able to get the playing time alongside Brandon Garrison, if you go and watch his game, and he talks about this with Polacek, you see strengths that you don't typically see out of your traditional big men that fit very well into the Mark Pope system, so to speak. He says in the interview with Polacek, some of my greatest strengths on the court are my passing, it's the first thing he says, and being able to score at all three levels in the post and out on the three as well. Defensively, I'm able to get out, disrupt the ball handler, and switch three through five. I can guard guys on the perimeter and in the post. Those are really my strengths on both sides of the court. 
And then he was asked again about where he wants to go and what that looks like. He said, looking at the colleges, I definitely want to go to a place that utilizes their bigs in terms of being able to score and make plays through their bigs. Whether it's on the perimeter or the post, it's definitely something I'll be looking into when deciding what college I want to attend. Do I even need to mention what Mark Pope and centers have kind of done during his time at BYU? Ali Khalifa. I think is an excellent example of what this kid could be. Halifanawa, if you think, if you're Julius, if you think your strengths are passing and scoring at all three levels, especially being able to step outside the arc and knock down shots, then ladies and gentlemen, there is no better place for you to go and play college basketball than the University of Kentucky with Mark Pope. There is no better place. And I know that he talks a little bit, actually, uh, when he discusses Virginia Tech about how um, the Hokies utilize their bigs quite a bit. If you go look at Kim Palm, that is true. They use their starting and their backup center quite a bit in terms of usage rate and actually distributing the ball and such. But I, I think that tempo, offense, utilization of bigs, I think that is more prominent at a place like Kentucky whenever you have somebody like Pope coaching and running the stuff. I think that Julius Halifanawa would fit perfectly. He's got a very, very nice post game. He is smooth, and I think the big thing for seven foot, two hundred ninety pounds, he's quick. He is very quick in the post, and he has a variety of different moves that he can get to to finish. Not necessarily directly at the rim, but also several steps outside, away from the rim, in the paint, kind of around the paint area. He's got floaters. He can absolutely knock down a mid-range jumper. He's got actually, for a seven-foot, almost 300-pound guy, he's got a really nice jumper. Just a clean, straight-up knockdown shot. I really like what I see in Halifanawa's game as far as an offensive threat. Is he the most athletic player on the floor? No, and that's going to come with the fact that he's 290 pounds and seven feet tall, but he can dunk, he can run, he can pass, he can shoot, he can do all these different things that Pope's going to want him to do. I think I'm not obviously on the coaching staff. I think this is as easy of a sell as you could possibly make. If, you, if you're looking for trust, if you're looking for good teammates, if you're looking for healthy culture, if you're looking for a place to be featured as an offensive prospect, Gonzaga, North Carolina, sure, you're going to be able to take a look at those programs and see that they win, that they have good culture for the most part, and that they utilize their bigs. Gonzaga more than more than almost anybody, right? Because of players like Graham E.K. and then the number of centers like Holmgren and different players that they've had in the past. I think Kentucky, as far as opportunities and as far as minutes and usage, this is the easiest sell Mark Pope could possibly make. And honestly, if we're putting up Pope's culture versus literally any other school in the nation, you can already see with a group of transfers that Pope went and got 12 different guys that are now all collectively here together, nine transfers, three different freshmen. You can tell through the videos, you can tell through the interviews, this is an extremely likable team. This is an extremely passionate team and just energetic, and just nice, kind team. They, like, the players just seem like good men. They just seem like good people, and they they definitely, every single time there's a camera around them, we don't know what they're like outside of the cameras, but I can tell you for certain, these kids really do seem to care about what's going on here. They seem to care about each other already. J Julius Halfanella, I think, would be best served to really take a strong look at the Kentucky Wildcats. So that's what we know about Julius Howell, for now a four-star prospect, somebody that I think Kentucky should really be in pursuit of. We'll see what he does here uh, towards the end of the um, end of the uh, end of the week, whether or not he does reclassify or not. Let me know what you think in the comments below. All right, let's wrap up the show talking a little bit here about the SEC, what's going on at media days before the Wildcats take the podium tomorrow. We've got some interesting news surrounding conference schedules as a report from Ross Dellinger 
has emerged, according to uh, the uh, the latest report for Ross Dellinger. After failing to get conference members on board last offseason with a nine-game conference mode with the additions of Oklahoma and Texas coming this season, the momentum could now be there for Commissioner Greg Sankey. The SEC agreed to, temper- to a temporary eight-game model that was locked in for the 2024 and 2025 seasons with the same opponents for each program in a home-and-home setup. But minds are now changing, according to Dellinger. Those pro Programs at first adding uh, at those programs at first against adding a ninth conference game are more interested now in doing so, according to multiple administrators at conference schools. A way to enhance schedules with bigger matchups and generate more cash through ticket sales as well as the television contract with ESPN. Kentucky was one of those schools, according to KSR. The move could now make sense for most more schools due to revenue sharing likely arriving in 2025. Thanks to the House versus NCAA settlement, the league would be expected to lock in a 3-6-6 scheduling model with three permanent opponents and the 12 remaining 12 SEC programs appearing on the schedule every other year. The sell for the conference could be easier with the college football playoff expanding to 14 teams. More changes coming to college football. The move to nine conference games seems inevitable for the SEC. That move could force Kentucky to consider canceling the Governor's Cup series with Louisville. First of all, I just want to say this. I actually wrote a piece on this uh, on my Substack um, probably two months ago month and a half ago about the SEC and the expanded playoff in a hypothetical scenario where you do get 14 teams. In case you don't know, the playoff is expanding to 12 this season. And the SEC and the Big Ten came to the playoff committee and essentially said, "Um, why don't you potentially expand it to 14 and give us automatic buys um, in that 14-team playoff? Uh, To which the rest of the country said, why on earth would we allow you to do that? You already essentially run this sport. Why would we let you have automatic buys? That's not going to happen. Well, it actually may end up happening. Um, potentially, we'll see what we'll see what actually does go down. But in that article, uh, I essentially asked the question: uh, Why does it matter? It doesn't necessarily matter, in my opinion, because of the fact that the SEC and Big Ten have essentially run this sport for so long. In fact, if you go and look at the BCS era and the college football playoff era, uh, it was more likely for a Big Ten or an SEC team to win the national championship in an expanded field, in an expanded playoff, than just the head-to-head matchup. And there have actually been more SEC versus SEC national title games in the playoff uh, in the playoffs uh, history than there have been in the BCS. So I don't really think it matters one way or another. The sell for the conference being you could expand to 14 teams and kind of making things easier for the. I, I don't think it matters uh, to me as a consumer. I, I just want to watch football. The, the SEC and the Big Ten are going to get it done essentially every single year regardless of what happens. That's just the reality of it. Better athletes, better conditioning, better coaches, better schemes. If you put them up against more opponents that have less than that, sure, there are going to be opportunities for upsets, but more likely than not, they're going to see the better team win out. Just how it's going to work. This is not college basketball where you have opportunities for runs and you have opportunities for player for major upsets and buzzer, buzzer beaters and things like that. I think there's more of an athletic gap Uh, in football, and I think a lot of it is attributed to the resources that these individual high-profile programs have, Uh, there's a a larger gap between your Alabamas, your Clemsons, your LSUs, your Georgias, Ohio States, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, as opposed to your group of fives or your mid-majors, as you would see in basketball. So I don't necessarily think this matters, whether it expands or not. And frankly, for the average college football consumer, I don't necessarily think it matters if you expand to nine games. I mean, we've already seen this happening with the Big Ten, where they've done this for years now. They've had a nine-game conference schedule. You play three non-con games, and you just sort of rotate things in and out. The SEC, I think this would be not like a culture shock or anything. In fact, I think it would be more fun for the average college football consumer to see somebody in the SEC play another conference opponent on a night where you would normally see them play a cupcake, whether that be late November, whether that be for third week of September, what have you. But for Kentucky, this does make things legitimately a little bit more difficult. When you look at the way that the Wildcats are kind of ranked here inside the SEC and how things kind of project moving forward, unless Kentucky has a good year this year, 
and they are able to continue to recruit at a decent to high level, you're not going to see the Wildcats kind of pushing into that upper echelon of the conference a ton, or at least you're not going to be able to project that in confidence. I think this season for the Kentucky Wildcats is going to be very important, not just for the Wildcats as a program, but also for Coach Mark Stoops. If Mark Stoops does not have a 8-4 and four or better type of year in my mind, even with as difficult a schedule as he has out in front of him, I would consider it a failure. In my opinion, gone are the days of saying, hey, 6-6, six and 7-5, six, and five, it's just going to be A-OK for Kentucky to have every single year. Sure, that'll happen every other year. But in the years where you bring in a former five-star quarterback, in the years where you have one of the best receiving cores in the SEC, in the years where you have a top 10 NFL draft pick on your defensive line and a defensive line in general, that's just going to be very, very good. You start to put these pieces together and you realize, hey, this is a staff that is capable of winning eight, nine, 10 games. They should do that with this roster. If they're not able to prove concept again, I'll say this again. If you're if you're not able to prove concept this season, then how confident is your fan base in you moving into a much more difficult SEC? I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I I can say in confidence. Yeah, this program is in phenomenal hands if you are just kind of hitting the bare minimum or failing with the roster that you have constructed that on paper looks pretty good. Stoops was almost out last year. Let's not let's not make let's not beat around the bush. He was almost gone. He was almost at Texas A&M. Could there be a departure if Kentucky goes five and seven, six and six? And I'm not saying a firing. I'm saying does he leave? And if so, where does Kentucky turn? I think this is a very big year for Kentucky. And adding nine an, an extra game to their conference slate. It's just going to make things a little tougher for what is a, right now, I think a middle-of-the-pack SEC team. It's just where they're at currently. If you want to maintain that status and you want to be able to possibly move up, you're going to have to, I, th- I think the investment as far as financially, I think it's it's starting to get there, I think just based on what we've seen. People are pouring money into this program. You got to be able to go get the wins on the recruiting trail first, and then you have to be able to go bring in some wins this year against this schedule. Eight and four is where I'd like to see the Kentucky Wildcats, and frankly, I have higher expectations than that. I said earlier this year, you're not really that far away from talking yourself into a world where Kentucky gets really close to making the college fo- football playoff or gets in. If you look at their schedule this year, this is going to be, I think, a golden opportunity for Kentucky to take advantage of some things. The fact that Florida's down, the fact that you get Georgia at home, the fact that you're cross, you're across from the uh, from what would be, I guess, the SEC West that is no longer exi- that doesn't exist anymore is Auburn at home. Not a, not a very good team this season. Look at the way this stacks up. Southern Miss to begin the season. At home. South Carolina in week two. You cannot look over the Gamecocks. I know that Shane Beamer and South Carolina, they've been less than average over these past couple of seasons. But you can't look them over. They have a talented quarterback. They have a talented D-line. They, they, are, more, they are improved in the trenches, and that'll prove to be a tough game. Then you play Georgia week three. Georgia losing some pieces, but it's it's Georgia. It's the Bulldogs. Nobody's played UGA closer during Kirby Smart's tenure consistently than the Kentucky Wildcats. Obviously, Alabama's beaten them. But as far as in the division in the SEC East, nobody has played Georgia closer than Kentucky, more physical than Kentucky. You got a chance to do something big to start the year. If you start 4-0 after beating Ohio the next week, which could be a trap game. Then you start to cook. You go on the road at Ole Miss. Last time you were in Oxford, the thing that prohibited you from winning that game were sloppy turnovers, 
and absolutely abhorrent special teams. You clean it up, you can win that game. Obviously, this is a very different team. I think this is a more under control Ole Miss team, frankly. But Kentucky still got the receivers. They've got the quarterback. Got the team to go in there and win in Oxford. Vanderbilt at home. On the road at Florida, who is expected to not even make a bowl this season. Auburn, who is improved, but still not very good. And you get them in Lexington. There's a great chance before you go into your final four games of the season that you could either have one loss against Georgia or you could be undefeated in a crazy world. Let's just say you have one loss, right? And the goal would be to take one more, no more than one more, and finish 10-2 and two and have a great shot to get into the CFP. I think it's going to be tough, though, because you play at Tennessee after you play Auburn. Which I'm not. I'm not sure what to make of the Vols with uh, Nico. I believe it's uh, uh, Yamaliva, or it's it's. Uh, I, I don't know how to pronounce his last name. It's the same with DJ Uyunglele. Um Tennessee maybe slept on. I'm not sure. It's going to be an interest. That's going to be just a, how it feels whenever you get to that game type of type of type of vibe. Murray State should be a win, but at Tennessee and then at Texas after you play Murray State. Then you play Louisville at home to wrap up the season. Tennessee, Texas, Louisville. At that point, you would have to go two and one. It's doable. It's doable. I'll say that. It is possible for Kentucky to win at Tennessee, or three and one, excuse me. Win at Tennessee, beat Murray State, and beat Louisville. Lose to Texas. Your two losses being to Georgia and Texas, two teams at that point, I would assume, would be in the college football playoff conversation. Kentucky could make a great case to be that third SEC team, especially if they've beaten a team like Ole Miss. If Auburn or Florida end up being better than we anticipate, or even South Carolina, this could end up being a pretty strong resume that the Wildcats put together at 10-2. and two. And you could alternate. You could wrote, you could alternate like different wins and losses. If I'll just say this: if you go ten and two and you end up being beating either Texas or Georgia, you should get in. Like there, there should be little to no conversation. Like oh yeah, ten and two team that beat Georgia, put them in. Who care? Who can? What they lose to Tennessee and what Ole Miss? <laughs> put them in. They they beat Georgia. They beat Texas. I think that the Wildcats. I think they're putting themselves in a really good position here. Like on paper, and they could cook if they beat Georgia or if they just start the season off hot. But again, it starts this year. You cannot build towards the future in a more difficult league than if you don't do things now. Final thing I want to talk about. Could this lead to the elimination of the Governor's Cup? A series with Louisville that Kentucky now leads 15 to 20, by the way. Kentucky won the last five meetings in this uh, in this matchup. Cut them up 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 20, 23 through 2018. And almost every single one has been a blowout or a double-digit victory outside of last year where Kentucky tried to give the game away a few times but ended up clutching up. A shout-out, Ray Davis. It's It would be a shame to lose a rivalry game. And frankly, right now, I'd be ashamed to win or lose a win on the schedule. This is a team you've beaten five years in a row. Five straight years, half of a decade of beating the Louisville Cardinals. They should be about an 8-4 and four type team again this year. Should be on Kentucky's level. Get them at home. You should be favored to beat them again. I, it'd be a shame to lose a game that you feel good about winning. That's also a rivalry game. That also brings in revenue, if you're looking at it from that perspective. But at the same time, nine-game conference schedule's tough. And if you do end up sacrificing the Governor's Cup, and you do end up being a middle-of-the-pack SEC team, getting that third non-conference game against a Mac team instead of Louisville, I think could end up being huge. Could end up being big. 
Now, I think it's going to be weird for Kentucky fans to kind of end the season on what I would expect to be a, non, a, a conference opponent at that point, which who do you end the season with consistently? It can't be Tennessee because they would usually end the season with Vanderbilt. Could be, could potentially be somebody like Florida. I don't know. Maybe, maybe it's somebody different every year. Not quite sure what they would do there. But I think, it's a, I think it's, it would stink from one perspective, but also benefit Kentucky in the long run. But I'm such a proponent of keeping rivalry games that I, this would disappoint me. So let me know what you think in the comments below about the nine-game schedule, about Kentucky, the playoff, the schedule this year, Julius Howe Fanawa. Let me know about all of it in the comments below. That's going to do it for today's episode of Locked On Kentucky. Hey, you can follow the show on Twitter at Locked on UK. You can follow me on Twitter at Lance Daw underscore, and you can follow the show over on Instagram. That is at Kentucky Podcast. Any questions, comments, concerns, leave those in the YouTube comments below. Hit me on the socials. I will see you all tomorrow for another episode of Locked on Kentucky. Hope you guys have a great rest of your day, and God bless.